Good evening. My name is Jürgen Schwarzer. I'm from the University of Edinburgh. It's uh, a great, great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, webinar on the management of allergic rhinitis and allergic asthma. This is the first webinar we do as SARA. SARA is the Scottish Allergy and Respiratory Academy based at the University of Edinburgh. We will have a program of three presentations, starting with a presentation on the management of allergic rhinitis that I will give, followed by a presentation on the practical management of allergic rhinitis by uh, Anne McMurray, and we will finish off with a presentation on allergic asthma by Professor Hilary Pinnock. As attendees, you will not be able to share your audio or video feeds, but please do post questions via the Q&A panel on this uh, Zoom platform. We will then select the most popular questions and we'll put them to the speakers at the end of the webinar. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted later on YouTube so that you can review uh, the information at your leisure. So let me try and switch to my other presentation. So, hay fever, diagnosis and management. What I would like to do in the next few minutes is to talk to you about the symptoms, signs, and the impact of allergic rhinitis. And I will focus on hay fever given the time of the year. I will talk about triggers and will then talk about medical management, but in particular, drug therapy and immunotherapy. You will know the main symptoms of allergic rhinitis or allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. Things like a runny, itchy nose, bouts of sneezing, a blocked nose, snoring, itchy and burning eyes. And importantly, very often poor sleep and tiredness. Things you may be less aware of is this. This is the allergic salute that you see. And if you do this repeatedly, you may end up with a transverse crease over the back of your nose. This is particularly a sign for people who have chronic perennial allergic rhinitis throughout the year. In a consultation with your patients, you may see this young boy, or this school age girl, or this young gentleman. What do they have in common? They are all mouth breathing. Why are they mouth breathing? Because the nose is blocked by the allergic rhinitis. This is a telltale sign of allergic rhinitis, which is very often overlooked. And I guess the main reason is that usually the patients themselves and the parents think that breathing like this is completely normal because they've done this for years and are used to it. And if you inspect the nasal passage with an otoscope, you may see something like this. In the middle, you see the septum of the nose, and here laterally, you see a big swollen inferior turbinate, which almost completely occludes the nasal passage, accounting for the blockage and accounting for things like mouth breathing. Typically, the mucosa you see here will be sort of pale pink. But with allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, you also have uh, signs around the eyes. This picture here shows you dark reddish discoloration below both eyes. These are referred to as allergic shiners. And the skin has become coarse and these lines have formed. Uh, they are Denny Morgan lines. This is something you will see particularly in people with long-standing uh, allergic rhinoconjunctivitis often throughout the year. Acute symptoms may look like this. This is an acute allergic conjunctivitis. Could be in somebody with um, a, acute exposure to their hay fever trigger, for example. Or you might see this, chemosis. Chemosis is a term that describes the conjunctiva swelling and bulging out, as you may be able to see here around the eye. Something that I've 
heard of from my patients every now and then and usually is very alarming to them. So the main clinical signs just summarized again are a runny nose, bouts of sneezing, mouth breathing, potentially the allergic salute and a transverse nasal crease. And if you inspect the nose, you will see enlarged turbinates, at least on one side um, of the nose. And for people who really have an allergic rhinoconjunctivitis with eye involvement, uh, you will see signs on conjunct of conjunctivitis and you may see the allergic shyness and the Denny Morgan lines that I've shown you. Now, allergic rhinitis has a major impact. It's a common condition. It's a, it affects about 25% of adults and up to 15% of children in the UK. And over the last years, its prevalence has been increasing. It significantly reduces people's quality of life, more so than asthma. And an important part of that is the interference with sleep, which occurs in the majority of patients with an allergic rhinitis. They don't sleep well, they don't have deep REM sleep phases, and end up being tired with poor concentration, irritable, potentially depressed, and many studies show very clearly that attendance and performance both at work and at school is clearly reduced. And allergic rhinitis has considerable uh, direct treatment costs and then indirect costs by loss of productivity. For this reason, I think it's really important to diagnose allergic rhinitis if it occurs uh, in people. This a uh, diagram from a publication by Brian Lipworth and colleagues uh, provides a nice algorithm how to diagnose allergic rhinitis. I will not go into this in detail uh, because you can go back and look at this at your own leisure once this lecture is uploaded. What I want to focus on is symptoms that are not associated with allergic rhinitis. And these are primarily unilateral symptoms. So if everything consistently only happens on one side of the nose, this is unusual. Nasal obstruction without any other symptoms is probably not allergic rhinitis. Discharge of pus from the nose is unlikely to be allergic rhinitis. A post-nasal drip of thick mucus or if there's no rhinorrhea, if there's no discharge uh, uh, to the front of the nose, again, would be unusual. Pain, recurrent uh, nosebleeds and the loss of smell are also not signs of allergic rhinitis. In these cases, the different differential diagnosis need to be considered. And these are a non-allergic rhinitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, nasal polyps, which may be a sign of cystic fibrosis, or nasal tumors. And people in whom such diagnoses are likely need to be referred to an ENT specialist. So what are the triggers of allergic rhinitis? For hay fever, it's seasonal allergens. It's grass pollens in the summer, tree pollens in the spring, weeds more into the summer towards the old, uh, autumn, and molds that are encountered outdoors. For perennial allergic, rhin uh, allergic rhinitis, which occurs throughout the year, the triggers are primarily indoor allergens, house dust mite, pets, um, and more molds that are, uh, that are encountered indoors. And then there are also irritants like rape flower, lilies, perfumes that can make symptoms of allergic rhinitis uh, much worse and trigger exacerbations. This pollen calendar published by Asthma UK shows really nicely that um, pollens that may cause allergic rhinitis problems are there for most of the year, from early on in the winter all the way into at least the middle of September, starting with tree pollens like hazel, yew and alder, later on in the spring, birch and ash. Now we are in the middle of the grass pollen season, and I'd like to point out that grass pollen exposure can happen well into September, and then later on in the year, um, weeds are important. If you look at average pollen levels across the UK on the left-hand side, you see that the highest exposures are in sort of the southern parts of England. 
But in Scotland, you have significant exposure to pollen as well, here in the central belt uh, and in other areas as well. I've chosen the pollen forecast from the Met Office here on the right-hand side for Wednesday because this was meant to be a warm and nicer day. And here you see high levels of pollen exposure in the south of Scotland, in the central belt, and here in the west of Scotland. So how do you manage allergic rhinitis or rhinoconjunctivitis? Allergen reduction and irritant, irritant avoidance is important, and Anne McMurray will talk to this. I will focus on pharmacotherapy and immunotherapy. So the first level of treatment uh, would be a non-sedating oral uh, antihistamine or a topical antihistamine, something that people will often buy over the counter. And for many uh, people, this will uh, enable them to control their allergic rhinitis. It's possible, it's this first step to also try, try out uh, leukotriene receptor antagonists. But in a large number of people, this is not sufficient to control symptoms. And the next step is the use of intranasal corticosteroids with or without an oral antihistamine. If you prescribe intranasal corticosteroids, it's absolutely vital that you teach the patients how to use the, in the, the, the nasal sprays correctly. And if you, people have taken this therapy for a while and don't have good um, improvement of their symptoms, which you would expect to start occurring from three to four weeks into treatment, um, you need to assess their inhaler technique and teach them again if necessary. And also obviously try to assess and confirm adherence. If all of this is insufficient in controlling symptoms, the next step would be to use a nasal spray that combines a local antihistamine with fluticasone, um, a corticosteroid in a single device. Again, it's important to teach technique, and if this fails to improve things, to uh, assess adherence if possible. Most of this can happen, or all of this can happen in primary care. In secondary care, it is thought that many patients will have gone through these steps and one might start with this combination with azelastine and fluticasone. However, very often in my patients, I see that they have maybe used intranasal corticosteroids, but with poor technique. So improving technique here and giving this another try uh, is usually warranted. There are specific situations in which other therapies can be tried. For people who have primarily problems with rhinorrhea, hypertropium bromide uh, may be worth a try. Chromoglycate may be worth a try or leukotriene receptor antagonists if they haven't been tried. And if people have important life events, things like um, exams, weddings, uh, job interviews or whatever, you may want to give them short-term relief by suggesting the, the, the short use of a decongestant uh, for something like up to five days or the short use of an oral corticosteroid for uh, five days or maybe a bit more. If all of this fails in uh, providing relief from uh, allergic rhinitis symptoms, we would consider immunotherapy. Immunotherapy, is a treatment that tries to induce tolerance uh, to the allergen in patients. It works best in patients whose symptoms are driven by a single allergen. So somebody who maybe has really significant, intense, grass pollen driven hay fever, but no allergic rhinitis otherwise throughout the year. The immunotherapy started um, out of the pollen season, so usually in the winter months. And it is a treatment with some risks. It can lead to episodes of anaphylaxis and asthma attacks. Therefore, poorly controlled asthma is an absolute contraindication for immunotherapy. And perennial asthma throughout the year, a relative contraindication, depending on how well the patient is controlled. And it is vital that any immunotherapy is only given in settings where 
anaphylaxis and asthma attacks can be efficiently uh, treated and controlled. There are two modalities, the traditional subcutaneous immunotherapy, which might be, for example, six injections of pollen over nine weeks in the winter months, and this is repeated uh, for three years. And this immunotherapy is available for grass pollen and tree pollen here in Scotland. Um, there's also sublingual immunotherapy, which has been shown to be um, efficacious. Um, it requires treatment for three years. And in the UK, one preparation for grass pollen is licensed. However, in Scotland, this is not recommended for use in the NHS by SMC. So I hope that I've given you an overview of symptoms of allergic rhinitis and rhinoconjunctivitis, its diagnosis, symptoms that should alert you that you're dealing with something else, and the uh, suggested management. Thank you very much. I will now uh, invite, let me stop sharing. I will now invite um, Anne McMurray. Anne McMurray is a specialist asthma nurse in NHS Lothian, and she will talk about the practical management of hay fever. Thanks, Jürgen. So I'm just going to go over some of the practical management of hay fever, just giving you um, some insight in um, some strategies to avoid pollen exposure, and also look at some of the practical techniques which Jürgen mentioned are so important to ensure our patients are getting the medications that they require. So we'll have a brief look at the pollen calendar, and um, we'll talk about some practical tips, some non-pharmacological treatments, nasal douching, eye drop technique, and then I'll give you a demonstration of nasal steroid technique and a demonstration of the new Era Chamber Plus Flowview spacers. There'll also be um, a list of web links, which we will add uh, to the end of the YouTube video. So as Jürgen mentioned earlier, there is the uh, pollen calendar, which is available on ASME UK. What we would try and ask our patients to do is identify what their trigger is. And ideally, if they know that they're going to have problematic symptoms, which can trigger off either bad allergic rhinitis or their asthma, we would ask them to start treatment for this about a month in advance of the pollen um, kicking in. One of the other things, obviously Jürgen showed you a chart um, of pollen counts, but patients can download their own apps. And I downloaded an app earlier, which um, made me aware that the pollen count in my area was gonna be um, of a medium level, but it also outlined what the pollens were likely to be. So I would be exposed to grasses, plantain, oilseed and pine. You can also follow um, pollen charts on social media. Just to be aware, in Scotland we're very lucky, we get a lot of rain, so on the rainy days it does wash down the pollen um, and lowers the pollen count. I would draw um, awareness to the problem with thunderstorms, so although thunderstorms are not common or regular in Scotland, um, it is a phenomenon that has been reported and that has led to a number of fatal asthma attacks. So the theory is that during the day, the pollen grains get swept up into the clouds, they're broken down into tiny particles, and then there is a dumping of pollen um, alongside the, th the thunderstorm, which will then trigger off an attack. So I would again, along with following the pollen count, just watch the weather and look for those thundery days. And if it is a recognised trigger for your patients, just make sure that they're aware of how to manage their asthma during an amber, um, amber part of their plan or the red zone of their asthma plan. So coming in on a, um, a hot sunny day, whenever the pollens count is high, we would recommend that patients have a shower or wash their hair um, before settling down for bed at night. Pollen is particularly um, indestructible um, unless it's wet. So a shower before bedtime will often make the patients feel more comfortable. Although it is really difficult on a warm sunny day, we would advise that windows are kept shut, especially in the early mornings and um, whenever the pollen's being released and in the early evening, whenever the air cools and the pollen um, starts to fall to the ground. 
So it's an excuse not to mow the lawn because uh, obviously this would trigger off some symptoms. But other things to think about just whenever you're out and about is to wear a pair of sunglasses which wrap around the eyes. And also the recommendation is to wear a wide brimmed um, or peaked hat which could help keep the pollen off your eyes and face. And unfortunately, we would advise clothes are dried inside whenever pollen counts are high, again, to prevent the pollen sticking to the bed linen or clothes. From um, whenever you're in the car, we would advise that the windows were kept closed and that the air is on a recirculate mode rather than um, blowing out. Um, if you have the ability to buy a car that has got a pollen filter, that's great. However, there are some car filters which can be inserted into the car. And if you've got pets, cats and dogs particularly carry pollen on their fur, so it may be that you need to wipe them down with a damp cloth if they'll let you to remove the, the pollen. So just thinking about some of the non-pharmacological management, if you refer to the Allergy UK guidance um, on hay fever management, they do suggest the insertion of a nasal balm and you could either do this by buying one of the ones over the counter, um, such as a brand known as Haymax. It comes in a small pot, but probably lasts two or three, if not more, hay fever seasons. Um, and it's just applied just inside the nose. Or Vaseline works equally well. There are some hay fever wipes available on the market. Again, they're fairly cheap and it's entirely up to your patients if they want to try them. Uh, for some people, it does work quite well. We often get asked about local honey, but unfortunately there is no evidence to suggest that this will actually help um, reduce hay fever symptoms. So moving on to nasal douching, um, this is recommended in the BSACI guidance on the management of allergic rhinitis. And the suggestion is that it would be done before the nasal steroid is, is uh, put into the nose. But it can also be used at other times throughout the day whenever the patient is feeling particularly congested. So just looking at some examples, um, Steramar is a, a trade name of a salty washout. It is available on prescription um, and it is very simple to use. There's a good training video on their website, but all you have to do is keep the head upright, um, apply one spray into the nostril, press down on the nostril, after the um, spray is instilled and then blow the nose gently and that's repeated on the other side. Nailmed is another um, nasal douching mechanism however this is not available on prescription and patients would need to purchase it and it would probably cost about £18 for a pack. To use this they need to make up the salty solution in the bottle um, they would then lean forward over the sink they would press um, steadily into the bottle and um, into the nostril. And you can see in this diagram, it goes in one side and comes out the other. They advise the, the mouth being um, left open throughout this procedure so that the patient doesn't swallow it. And then after that, the patient would be rocking their head from side to side gently and blowing their nose. We also have a, a, um, a, a referral here to the Elvis study, which looked at using um, gargling of, of salty water and nasal irrigation with salty water. And it has a really nice video on how to make up this solution and also how to uh, do some nasal douching. So three options. With eye drops, it's really important to remember that you can only ever put one drop um, into the eye at a time. So we would advise um, our patients to wash their hands first, then to pull down the lower lid, to hold the bottle over the eye and allow one drop to fall in, and then to close the eye and keep it closed for a few minutes. We have a number of eye drops available, um, some which have preservatives in them and can be quite stingy. So if your patients tell you that the eye drops are uncomfortable, they may need to ask for a preservative free drop and they could discuss this with their pharmacist. So just before I close down my slides and give you the practical demonstrations, these are the web links which will be placed um, on the YouTube video. So I'm going to demonstrate um, two spacers today, and these are the newest available aero chambers, um, which are called Aero Chamber Plus Flow View. 
The unique selling point about these spacers are that they are all anti-static coated. So it means that we no longer have that dilemma about priming devices before use. They also have a very visible um, valve above the nose so that we can see the patient taking breath in and out. And for now, the newest one that is available, the green one, is devised for children. So it has no positive pressure when the patients are breathing in and out. So it's very comfortable to take breaths in and out. We're advising five breaths in and out for every spacer which is available, whether that be a large volume spacer or a small volume spacer. So if we start with the yellow error chamber, which is um, advised for children aged one to five, we may need to use it for slightly older children if they're having an attack or if parents find it a challenge to get them to use a mouthpiece. We would always shake the inhaler before use, pop it in the flat end and place the face mask gently over the child's nose and mouth. We would press down once and we would watch the valve move five times in and out over the child's nose and mouth. The device should then be removed completely and you should wait for 30 seconds between your first and your second dose. Cleaning instructions have changed for this device, but it's really important that you make sure that it is the correct device because the original air chamber looks very similar to the new one, but the new one is suitable for dishwashers. So you would unscrew the top, remove the plastic bit at the end, and they all go in the top drawer of the dishwasher. They should be removed before the drying cycle and they should be replaced once a year. To use the green youth spacer, we would advise this for all children up to the age of 16. And it's still appropriate for adult patients as well. It's just a lot more comfortable to use than the blue inhaler or the blue spacer rather that's available at the moment. So again, you would shake the inhaler. You would make sure that the whistle is on the upside and you would pop the inhaler into the flat end. If you hear the whistly noise, it means your patient is breathing too fast or too forceful and they need to go more gently. The patient should shake the inhaler and spacer, pop that into their mouth and take five gentle breaths in and out and then remove the device from their mouth. Cleaning instructions are exactly the same as the yellow one and it unscrews. Now I'm going to move on to nasal steroids. So as Jürgen said, it's really important that patients know how to use the nasal steroids correctly. Um, there's a couple of different devices available. There's one that, that is top actuated and one which is side actuated. Um, and sometimes it's important just to consider the size of the child or the patient, which um, one would be more appropriate. So if it was a small child or um, any child really, they usually prefer the smaller nozzle. These ones can be a bit more tricky and may be appropriate for an, um, an older child or adult. But we just want to think about what we're prescribing. So to use the nasal steroid, it's important that you shake the device first. The head should be propped down like you're reading a book and you should use the left hand to pop the steroid into the right nostril. So head down, in, spray, and very gentle sniff. And then you would shake, and again, down, in, spray, gentle sniff, okay? Usually what happens is patients pop the nasal steroids um, into their nose, always going towards the septum, always taking big sniffs in, and they'll get a, a taste down the back of their throat, which puts them off taking treatment. Or if they're continually pointing it towards the septum, it can cause nosebleeds and patients stop using treatment. So that's all I would like to demonstrate today. I'm going to pass on now to Professor Pinnock um, for a talk on allergic asthma. Hilary? Can I? Yeah, I'm just. Oh, okay. Should be coming. It takes a few seconds to just 
is the screen sharing? Yes, the screen has shared, I think. Okay, right. Thank you for um, inviting me to, to do this talk. Um, and I've been given the task of talking a bit about allergic asthma. Um, Anne was very upset at the sight of the picture I've chosen for the front, but chosen very carefully, Anne, because this is exactly... I cannot patient. see your screen. Sorry, oh. I can't see your screen unless that's just me. Just sharing, hang on. Susan, does sharing work? Failed to start, please try again. Let's try again. Let's try. Ah, it's just not doing it. We'll try again. Let me come out of that. Right, I'll try again from the beginning. It's that one we want. Yeah, great. Ah, better. Okay. Right. So, um, I wanted to tell you about a patient I saw on Friday. Now, I live um, and work in uh, Kent, which is the bottom right corner of the red zone on um, Jurgen's map. Um, and on Friday, um, Max was one of three people with hay fever and asthma who came to see me. Um, Max is 12 years old um, and he's been wheezing. He's actually been wheezing increasingly badly for the last week or two. Um, he, and yes, he did come and see me. He spoke to one of my colleagues who triaged the call as we all have to in the COVID pandemic, um, quite rightly was brought down to actually see us. He was able to talk, um, though not particularly comfortably and he certainly had ronchi when I listened to his chest. And he had a history last June when he was admitted with asthma for the first time. He also has symptoms of hay fever, which were quite troublesome and a little bit in his eyes as well. At the moment, he's managing this with over-the-counter antihistamines and the salbutamol inhaler that he remembers from last year. So, and that's where that salbutamol inhaler came from. So the question to you, and I'm afraid you, we, can't ask you to answer it but I want you just to think about these were all the various things that went through my mind as I was talking to Max um, and his mother. Do we want to rescue his acute episode? Do we want to give him some inhaled steroids? Perhaps check his inhaler technique? Do we want to complete an action plan or do we want to prescribe a nasal steroid spray? Well I hope that your first priority is going to be to rescue his acute episode because he wasn't too bad when I saw him, but he was certainly a lot worse from the description in the middle of the night. Um, and I suspect he was going to get worse again. So the first priority in my mind was to rescue his acute attack. We gave him some more bronchodilator and we gave him some steroids, um, which will hopefully deal with all his symptoms. But I'd also hope that you wanted to do all these other tasks. Um, and in fact, I had one other question. Why hadn't we done all this during the course of the year since his um, admission last year? We should have actually tackled all these other problems with him. And maybe mum's got the clue here, because when I said to mum about his asthma and we had, you know, had she been to the asthma clinic, her immediate response was, it's only in the hay fever season, as if it isn't really asthma. And I think that's a problem that we share with parents, actually. I think we underestimate seasonal asthma. I've heard clinicians talking about it's only seasonal asthma. Let me give you a few reasons why only isn't the right word here. We're used to seeing graphs of deaths. This is the um, deaths in Scotland over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, what we don't see quite so often is these death rates um, worked out over the course of the seasons. Now in older people, um, the, the death rate from asthma goes up in the winter months, presumably related to infection. But in children and young people, um, it goes up in the middle of the year, June, July and August, almost certainly the related to the um, allergen seasons that we've been hearing about. And let's remember, of course, that Max is right in the middle of this age group and we are right in the middle of June. So this is not 
only seasonal asthma, it's an important condition. This is another study that looked into a confidential inquiry into asthma deaths from East Anglia and each of those squares are a, a person who died suddenly with their asthma. Um, most of these sudden deaths were males under the age of 20 and they almost all occurred with the, um, with the pollen season. There is one that didn't, that's number 51 who died in December um, and that was somebody who died at the horse of the year show and was known to be allergic to horses. So almost certainly all these deaths were, were asthma um, allergic related. So let's talk a bit about asthma and allergic rhinitis and it's already been noted, um, which makes a statement that many patients with rhinitis have asthma and the vast majority of people with asthma have rhinitis. Um, the, the association is very strong, the exact figures depend just how you measure it, but most people with asthma will have some symptoms of rhinitis um, and the onset of rhinitis is a strong risk factor for new onset asthma. The two are, are very closely connected. So there's this concept of it being one airway and one disease. It's the same allergic process um, going on in the, either the nasal mucosa or the lining of the airways. Um, and anatomically, the upper and lower respiratory tract are continuous, so it's perhaps not surprising that if one is affected, the other is likely to be. And there's also the idea about nasal obstruction preventing filtering, and those mouth breathers are not filtering the pollen before it gets to their lungs. So perhaps one of the rules and if one of the messages I'd like people to take away is that you should check for rhinitis in every asthma review, you should check for asthma in every hay fever consultation and I include there of course people who just request a prescription. Can we leave a message on that prescription? If you start to wheeze or you have chest symptoms please contact us. Um, and we need to assess and treat both the asthma and the rhinitis. The BTS sign guidelines, the latest update, have a, a, a new um, updated section on um, asthma reviews and assessing asthma control. And they highlight the importance of assessing symptom control and also future risk. We've traditionally in the UK used the RCP3 questions um, about difficulty sleeping. Max was having a lot of difficulty sleeping over the last week or so. Um, his usual symptoms during the day and whether it's interfered with the usual activities. And we know that those relate fairly well to the well-validated asthma control questionnaire and the asthma control test. Um, basically, if people answer no to all of those, then their asthma is probably well controlled. If they answer yes to any of them, you need to really probe more deeply as to what's going on with the asthma control. And you also need to think about risk. The major risk factor for future attacks is having had one previously. And we know that Max was hospitalized last year with a, an attack of asthma. Assessing the rhinitis traditionally distinguishes between intermittent symptoms that are on fewer than four days a week or for less than four weeks or persistent symptoms that are more than that. It's also traditionally divided between mild symptoms that don't actually interfere with activity um, and more moderate symptoms. And I think it's fair to say, and you can obviously cross between those, you can have intermittent, moderate and severe, persistent, mild. And I think it's fair to say that in Max's case, it's seasonal, but it's at the moment, it's definitely falling into this persistent and moderate to severe category. So if we've got one airway and one disease, have we got one treatment that will do for both? This is the Holy Grail and the ARIA guidelines talk about treatments for one condition could potentially alleviate the coexisting condition, um, though unfortunately the evidence is, is not that good, but I'm going to cover what, what we do know about the various treatments um, that might help. Antihistamines, and Jürgen has talked about these, um, are effective for helping the rhinitis, but do not affect the, the symptoms of asthma. So it is not a helpful treatment for asthma. Nasal steroids have been subjected to some tests to try and see if nasal steroids, they're very good for helping the symptoms of rhinitis, but do they reduce the symptoms of asthma? Um, and there is few studies. Um, this Cochrane review is quite out of date, but it's not been upgraded. Um, updated. So I think there's probably very few new studies. And basically there's small studies 
small number. And there is a suggestion, uh, if you look at the, um, the result there, there is a suggestion that they might improve lung function, but it doesn't quite reach statistical significance. And similarly with symptom scores, a suggestion that nasal steroids might improve the symptom scores, but again, it doesn't quite reach statistical significance. So overall, the efficacy in this one airway disease is not completely clear, but if anything, they probably help a little. So from point of view of treating Max, he needs to have um, a nasal steroid and he needs an, um, a steroid, an inhaled steroid inhaler. What about leukotriene antagonists? Um, Jürgen mentioned these. Um, no particular advantage. They have been used um, in, to, in asthma as well, so they are effective for some people with asthma. So there may be a role for them in somebody with allergic rhinitis and allergic asthma, um, though they're not actually widely used. Um, but there is some potential there to perhaps try. My experience with leukotriene antagonists is that they either work very well or they don't work. So it is something to consider, but they're probably less effective. Well, they are less effective than using inhaled steroids and nasal steroids. So whilst it's there as an option, um, from Max's point of view, he really needs the steroid treatment. Um, and I'm not really going to talk very much about the um, immunotherapy, um, effective for um, allergic rhinitis, um, but as to whether it improves asthma control, there seems to be very little data as to whether, as to whether that's helpful for the asthma symptoms. Um, and Jürgen's already pointed out that you've got to be careful, the patient is well controlled, you can't use um, these immunotherapy in poorly controlled disease. So Max came back to see me three days later, he's much better. Um, he's no longer wheezing, his hay fever's improved. So mum's question obviously is, does he really need all this treatment? And she'd also been Googling it and realized that steroids are dangerous. So we had to have a conversation about inhaled steroids and the safety profile and the risk benefits. He's on a fairly good dose really there, beclomethasone 200 uh, micrograms twice a day, and it may well be that we can um, reduce that down. So the first priority is to begin to titrate down the dose of inhaled steroids. The rule that I give is that it's the lowest dose that keeps max free of symptoms. And we need both parts of that statement. We want the lowest dose, but it must be enough to keep him free of symptoms. And of course, that means that it, towards the end of the season, he probably needs less um, of his inhaled steroid. He can reduce it gradually and stop it at the end of the season, as long as he's not getting symptoms for the rest of the year. Then there's the question of the um, nasal steroids. We've got two doses of steroids going into max, which is what was worrying mum for the inhaler and the nasal steroids. And we might want to consider the safety of the nasal steroids. They broadly fall into three groups. Betnasol are the drops, the ones that you have to sort of stand on your head to drip into your nose. They are very, um, they're 100% bioavailable and definitely not for um, long-term use and not something we'd want to use for Max. Um, then there's the, about half uh, bioavailability, but there are three, um, particularly mimetazone and platicazone, which are hardly uh, available to the systemically and are therefore probably the safest. So it's probably worth thinking in this context of using one of the, um, uh, one of the safer options there. And Anne has already told you how to use them. These drugs only work if they're used and if they're used correctly. The other thing we want to be thinking about, of course, for Max is supported self-management. And we should have been thinking about this after he'd had his attack last year, so that he was ready for this year. Um, everybody with asthma, and that includes Max, needs to know how to recognize deterioration, the action to take, when he should recommence, when he should increase his handheld steroids, when he should start oral steroids, and crucially, when he should call for help. So he needs a personalized action plan fill, filled in. And that has to include the management of his rhinitis and the seasonal advice um, so that Max and his mother, and it needs to be both, we need to talk to both Max and his mother so that they both know how to manage this condition. So just to sum up, a few take home messages for you. Asthma and rhinitis commonly coexist, and right now in the hay fever season, this is when we see this most dramatically. 
ask about and assess and treat both conditions. Don't underestimate seasonal asthma. Um, just remember that deaths in young people peak in the um, pollen seasons, in the allergic seasons. So don't underestimate it. Don't think about it as only seasonal asthma and make sure that he's brought into um, asthma clinics like any other person with asthma. Inhaled steroids are the treatment of choice for asthma, but nasal steroids certainly prevent the symptoms of allergic rhinitis and are safe, particularly if you consider mimetazone and fluticasone, and they might um, have some if, um, benefit in improving the asthma symptoms as well. And finally, ensure that Max and his mother have a self-management plan, have an action plan, um, and are aware how to manage their asthma and their rhinitis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilary and Anne, for these presentations. So now we have an opportunity to address some questions and to all participants, please still write in some questions. Um, Emma, do you want to read out the first question? Yeah, of course. So thanks very much, Hilary, Jürgen and Anne for the great presentations. And um, we've got two questions waiting at the moment. So we've got the first one from Noel Baxter. This one's for yourself, Jürgen. And Noel asks, do nasal steroid drops have different effectiveness to na nasal steroids? If so, why? Hmm. So basically they shouldn't have a there shouldn't be a real difference. I think the only thing I can think of is um, the way drops versus a spray distribute on the nasal mucosa. And I think it's likely that a spray, especially if it's a fine spray, um, has a much better distribution and reaches a larger surface area of the nasal mucosa and may therefore be more effective than drops. I also see, being a pediatrician, um, I would find it difficult to imagine how nasal drops are um, used effectively and accepted by many kids. Um, yeah, that's what I can say about that. Okay, great, thank oh, you. And do you have any insight into that? No, I, I kind of thought my understanding of nasal um, drops from the sachets came for, slightly, for, for nasal polyps rather than um, allergic rhinitis, so different conditions being treated and the, the way that they're instilled is completely different. So the head is tilted far back for nasal drops, whereas tilted forward for nasal steroids. So I think it's two different conditions you're treating um, with the two different preparations. Hilary, have you anything to add? Not really, only that I have occasionally used the drops in somebody with a really very blocked nose, but with strict instructions, they have to sort of stand on their head for five minutes to let them get into the nasal cavity. But if somebody's really kind of desperate, um, I, I do think occasionally it works, but short term, I've only ever done it in adults. Um, and I've just occasionally had some, some success with, with doing that, but only in motivated people who've really got a lot of problems. Um, and as I say, only in adults, only short term. And of course, given the um, bioavailability, it may also be working systemically. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and this one's for yourself, Anne. Um, are there any particular tips in managing severe allergic conjunctivitis? Is immunotherapy available for patients for this or only AR? So for allergic conjunctivitis, I would recommend using either sodium chromoglycate or olipatidine, which are eye drops. The sodium chromoglycate four times a day can be a bit of an adherence issue, especially with with children and as I said earlier it can come as either containing a preservative and can sometimes be quite stingy and um, but you can get preservative free or olipatidine is used um, one drop twice daily for a maximum of four months so there's your two options you could also try some of the sealing and um, for washing out the eye as well so something like um, Optrex or Optimist which is another one that can be spread over and I think if your symptoms are so difficult to manage, so you're using antihistamine, um, you're using your eye drops, and the eye is the main problem, you may need to consider referral to ophthalmology. Hilary, anything to add? 
No, I don't think so, really. I think you've summed that up, really. It's how we would normally, you know, try to tackle these allergic rhinitis problems. And the problem is they just, you just want to rub the eye and the more you rub, the more swollen the eye gets. So again, you, the hot showers are good to kind of get the, all that pollen washed out of the hair and um, wearing the sunglasses, but it is a real problem for patients having really uncomfortable eyes. Mm. I mean, just to briefly add one thing I've tried to, or I've used quite a bit is Ladoxamide, which is a mast cell stabilizer that can also be helpful as eye drops. Then I'd just like to reiterate, if the sim symptoms are significant, you need an ophthalmologist to look at it. And that's completely out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And part of the question was if immunotherapy is available for, let's say, pollen-induced uh, allergic conjunctivitis. And yes, it is. So um, that can be an indication if people cannot be controlled otherwise. And we've, we've treated people with uh, pollen immunotherapy. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Julia Foss and she asks, how do you choose which antihistamine to prescribe? Do you encourage to buy over the counter where possible? Yes. Hilary, yours. Yes. Um, I, I always, I mean, we, we do occasionally prescribe antihistamines, yes, but 99% of the time, particularly for the hay fever season, um, we would very definitely expect patients to buy their own. Um, the really only the rule of thumb that I give is just it's worth paying a few pence extra and getting one that doesn't make you drowsy. Um, and I would expect I always advise people to speak to the pharmacist um, and to buy one that doesn't make them drowsy. Great. So we would recommend either ceterazine or loratadine as first choice on formularies. Um, and those, as Hilary said, they're available um, for purchasing over the counter and for adult patients, we would definitely recommend that. Um, but for children, they often need liquid and that can be slightly more expensive. So it's available on minor ailments through the pharmacies. Um, so something, as Hilary said, discuss with your pharmacist. But if um, neither of those antihistamines were working, then they would need to discuss with their GP one that was available on prescription only. And a big no-no at this time of year, no paracetamol, chlorphenamine, which is the one that Hillary's referring to, sedating antihistamine. People give it to their kids and they go out and get on a bike and fall off. So it is a really sedating antihistamine and we don't want that used um, commonly. Okay, um, next question is, is there a maximum duration for using a INS if symptoms are not short-term seasonal issues? So um, the short answer is no. Um, the longer answer is um, inhaled nasal, nasal corticosteroids are safe if you stick with the uh, suggested dosages. So I see many children with perennial allergic rhinitis and initially will prescribe a three month course. Um, at the end of which I suggest they stop and see what happens. But unfortunately, for many people, the symptoms will just reoccur. And then you've got different options. What I prefer is repeated courses of eight to, eight to 12 weeks with a brief break, and then to just restart these courses. But I must say that we have some, that I have some patients who are continuously on inhaled nasal corticosteroids and require them because as soon as they stop, they have major issues. But I think it's important that you assess them regularly, especially in primary care to really find out if they still need their nasal steroid. But it's also important for the patient to be aware how to assess themselves um, because actually it's back to the, the rule for inhaled steroids really, it's the lowest dose that keeps symptoms at bay. So I, I like to encourage patients to reduce the dose and if symptoms come back, they can go up again. So you know, I, th I think it's really important that patients are able to adjust their dose. Um, it's the lowest dose that keeps them free of symptoms that we're aiming for. And I certainly have patients who do reduce their dose to you know, two or three times a week just to keep things away, or they just use it mainly for the weekend where for perhaps they're in contact with something, or, you know, there, there are people who adjust it. They're aiming for the lowest dose that keeps them free of symptoms. 
Thanks everyone. Um, the next question is, is immunotherapy generally widely available in Scotland? I don't believe that we have access to this in the Highlands. So, um, widely available is probably not the right term, no. Um, there are some centres that um, provide immunotherapy. Um, so I can only talk, speak for Lothian, um, in, for children and young people, we can provide this here, but I know that it's not provided for adults. Um, so this is an issue in Scotland, and you may well be right that you do not have access to that in the Highlands, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, the next question is, is there any specific advice for pregnant or breastfeeding parents? Thank you. Hilary? <laughs> <laughs> um, they can continue to use the, these preparations. Um, people worry about steroids, but actually I would, again, look at the safety profile. I'd probably go for mimetazone, which I think is the cheapest of the non-bioavailable um, um, nasal steroids, and that will keep most of them comfortable. Um, antihistamines are used in breastfeeding mothers. Um, so no, I would, the, my advice would certainly be pretty much the same treatment. And of course, if they've got asthma, it's absolutely clear that they need to maintain their asthma treatment exactly as if they were not pregnant, aiming still for the lowest dose that keeps them free of symptoms, but it's crucial that they maintain good control. Okay, I think we can take one more question, if there is one. There's one last one. Um, so the last question is, if we encourage our over-counter therapy for allergic rhinitis, how can we screen for asthma, which you have shown is highly associated? Yeah, absolutely. And maybe it's for our uh, pharmacy colleagues to know to answer. Well, there's two quest answers to that. One is for our pharmacy colleagues to know to ask the question. You know, when they sell an over-the-counter remedy for hay fever, they can ask you know, if they were, you must contact your, your clinician. Um, it could well be put in, and I do, I've never read the information inside a nasobec spray or whatever that people are buying to see if it actually has the question about whether if you wheeze, please see your GP. Um, but no, it, it, it's around publicity, isn't it? And it's around the pharmacist taking the responsibility. Um, and of course, the ones who are in trouble and are asking for help from us, we can definitely get that message across. Okay, thank you. So before we close, let me please share my screen with you again, in order that I don't forget to thank people. So thank you very much, Hilary and Anne, for your presentations. Thank you all for attending. And I really need to highlight and thank our sponsors, our industrial sponsors, me, Johnson, GSK, Kiesi, Arsenet, and Nutricia, who have been supporting Sarah in our educational um, activities. Uh, and this support is very much appreciated and necessary to continue this kind of work. I'd also like to thank Science, the Children's and Young People's Allergy Network Scotland, who've been longstanding partners of ours in these educational events. So thank you all very much again and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.